Hello, BookTube. I've got a bit of mail for you today on an overcast Saturday uh, that had an aborted adventure. I had an aborted adventure. I, I decided yesterday that I would go to the Boston Public Library book sale today. I don't need any more books. I got a I got 100 books when David Murphy was here a couple of weeks ago. I've been getting books at the Brattle since then. Uh, but I thought, it's a library book sale. It benefits the friends of the Boston Public Library who I like. Uh, but library sales can often be fun, even though the, li the Boston Public Library's book sale has way too many of those insectile dealers with their little phone apps. I've had words with them from time to time at these sales, and I don't want to have words with anybody. I don't like people. I don't want to talk to people. I uh, said my imaginary people, of course. <laughs> I, I told myself all of those mitigating factors, and then I thought, well, but go anyway. It's a lot of fun. And who knows what you'll find? Uh, and so I did, and I was so concentrating on battening down the hatches here, making sure everything's fine here, making sure that Frida is fine here, that she's contented and has a treat and whatnot, that I neglected the number one thing that I should have done, which is to check online about subway usage, because Boston's subway system can be really, really bad. <laughs> and I didn't do that. So I got to the subway station, there was a big, bright sign saying, no subway. <laughs> You'd have to use some sort of shuttle buses that I think are pulled by oxen or something like that. This would take me an hour to get to the Boston Public Library, and then God only knows how long it would take to get back. I wasn't about to do that to my poor little bean, who doesn't like it when I go away at all. Uh, so I turned on my heel and came back. And I'm trying not to view this as some sort of horrible tragedy, since I didn't need any more books. I don't need any more books. As we're going to see in this video, I get books in the mail for free. I don't need to get used books at all, <laughs> anywhere. Not just at the Boston Public Library, not just at the Book Barn, but at the Brattle either. <laughs> Nevertheless. Uh, I didn't go, so I don't have that adventure to report. Sorry. Uh but I do have mail. So I have, like, for instance, two great periodicals here, the TLS, the London Times Literary Supplement, and the LRB, the London Review of Books. Uh, both arrived today. That's going to be lots of, they just, I just found them, so that's going to be lots of fun to dig into these things. They are two of the best. Uh, and then we've got packages, including a box. Uh, so let's, let's see what we have here. Uh, to get us through a now suddenly book-free day. <laughs> I did not go to the Boston Public Library books. Oh, my. Oh, very nice. Okay. Boy, oh, boy. You know, once upon a time, you want to see the book, <laughs> but you have to go through a, a tedious Grandpa Simpson anecdote first. Once upon a time, in the book world, you could tell the level of quality of what was new by the publisher. That's unheard of, almost unheard of now, but once upon a time, it was true. Once upon a time, a long time ago, but still within my living memory, which is not very fair, it's a very long time, in my living memory, I knew book people, bookish people, who called themselves, well, I'm a Harcourt man, I, I'm a Norton man, where they swore by their publisher, they loved their publisher, they had such a great track record with one particular imprint that they would swear by it. That has largely gone away. I don't know why, but it does still cling to the publishing world in bits and pieces. I, th I suppose I do know why, right? It's a question of personnel. Uh, but nevertheless, the Belknap Press of Harvard University Press, they definitely count, as does the Liverite imprint of W.W. W. Norton. Uh, and this is, this is from the Belknap Press of Harvard University Press. So this comes out in August. This is a long time from now. And this is Simone Weil, A Life in Letters. Goodness gracious, look at that for a cover. How wonderful to give her that kind of Nancy Drew hair instead of her usual, uh, instead of the, the, the style that she used as an adult. This just knocks off the plaque of the, the formidable elderly, uh, older Simone Weil and gives us a person. What a wonderful choice for a cover. I mean, yes, it's a faded sapia tone photograph and usually I hate those, but in this case, Perfect choice. Uh, so I don't have I don't have a, sh a sheet for this. So we'll just read uh, the back of it here. Uh, this is an inspire the inspiring letters of philosopher, mystic, and freedom fighter Simone Weil to her family, presented for the first time in English. Now in the pantheon of great thinkers, she lived largely in the shadows, searching for her spiritual home 
while bearing witness to the violence that devastated Europe twice in her brief lifetime. She lived from 1909 to 1943. What a half decade to live. Good Lord. Uh, the letters she wrote to her parents and brothers from childhood onward chart her intellectual range as well as her itinerancy and ever-shifting preoccupations, revealing the singular personality at the heart of her brilliant essays. How wonderful. So this is entirely family and entirely before she became what she would be. How wonderful. The first collection of her missives to her family, A Life in Letters, offers new insights into her personal relationships and experience. Does this mean there'll be more? Will they do another one of more personal letters? Uh, the letters abound with vivid illustrations of a life marked by wisdom as much as seeking. Oh, I like that. Oh, I like that. The daughter of bourgeois Parisian Jewish family, Ray was a troublemaking idealist who preferred the company of miners and Russian exiles to that of her peers. An extraordinary scholar of history and politics, she ultimately found a home in Christian mysticism. She paired teaching with poetry and even dabbled in mathematics as evidenced by her correspondence with her brother Andre, who won the Kyoto Prize in 1994 for the famed Ray Conjectures. A Life in Letters depicts her thoughts taking shape amid political turmoil as she describes her participation in the Spanish struggle against fascism and in the transatlantic resistance to the Nazis. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. Uh... Oh my, I, or I almost said look at that, but I'm not showing it to you. This has enormous notes in the back. Just enormous, enormously detailed notes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, all right. And then the rest of the book is letters. And here you can see in the brackets that a lot of editorial care has been taken already to situate these things to the best of our ability. And there's a huge editor's introduction at the front. Okay, so this comes out at the end of August. So I need a biography of this person. <laughs> I need a definite, I don't have one. I definitely need a biography of this person to turn up at the brattle between now and then. <laughs> but I have a while to do. How wonderful. Good Lord. Serious scholarship. Fantastic. All right. Uh, what a great way to start. All right, let's move on to the next one here. Oh, the next one is more than one book. Great. Fantastic. What have we got here? Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. We go from an author who has always intrigued me uh, to an author I actually love. So, so and this is, this is the New York Review of Books. This is the NYRB classic line. Uh, two volumes. Two of their latest volumes. So one comes out in May. No, they both come out in May. Okay. Just one is not, is not really finished. Uh, the NYRB classics, they, they're a reprint line. They do really, really good, really interesting work. I've mentioned them many, many times on this channel. The one caveat that I sometimes have is not really a caveat, which is that, as I mentioned, when I was talking about imprints for, you know, Liverite or the Belknap Press or whatnot. It comes down to people. I, you, any of you who've ever worked on a literary journal of any kind will know it comes down to people. It comes down to whether or not you have the right people working in the right way together at the right time. Then all of a sudden you'll have a publishing house or an imprint or whatnot uh, that will work, that will shine. That's just, it's unpredictable. You can't hire for it. It's just the way it happens. Uh, and the people that they have at the NYRB, NYRB classic line are great. I perfectly acknowledge that. You can tell in a minute that there's no blind momentum, that they're thinking about what they're doing, and that they're all bookish people. You can tell that in a minute. It's just, they're not my kind of bookish people. They almost never do any work that I like <laughs> myself. So I'm, I'm going kind to of sit on the, on the sidelines and say, well, this is great work that they're doing. But if you, for most of their history, if you'd said, in, if I'd said, this is great work that they're doing, and you'd said, oh, so would you like the latest five books? I'd have said, not really, no. <laughs> But not in this case, because this is the poet Eugenio Montale, who is great. He's one of the great 20th century poets. And this is two uh, works of his. So we have Butterfly of Dinard, the classic NYRB livery there. And we have uh, late Montal, selected and translated by George Bradley. So this is a new translation of later, of later Montale, which is uh, not as well studied. It's not as, it's not as extensively studied as his earlier work. Because he took a long break from poetry. Uh, fantastic. Okay. Uh, so those are, we have two Eugenio Montale books 
coming from NYRB. Now, let me read you about them. They both come out in mid-May, so not far to wait for these. I didn't think I was on NYRB's list, but that's fantastic. Uh, so, Butterfly of Dinard is translated from the Italian by Una Stransky and Marla Maffa. It's an inventive, invigorating book by one of Italy's finest poets. Self-reflexive, uh, but not quite autobiographical, the book draws on that same reservoir of experience and memory from which the Nobel Prize winner's famous poetry derives. Using moments from Atale's own life, And the book is composed of a series of vignettes that jump between time and space, charting a course from idyllic childhood scenes at a summer home on the Ligurian coast to moments in a sleepy Italian gentleman's club in the immediate post-war period. The journey ends with a stunning finale set in a cafe where the narrator considers his relationship with the eponymous butterfly. As these episodes accumulate, a rarely seen portrait takes shape, revealing an eminent literary figure in spectacular color and depth. Uh, okay, I, I'm trying to remember if I've ever read this in English. I, I don't think that I have. This can't possibly be... Does it mention? This can't possibly be the first English translation of the whole thing. This modestly expanded reissue from NYRB Classics features five stories absent from the first English translation of 1970. Okay. Uh, okay, <laughs> fantastic. Uh, this, well, this will be effectively new then uh, to me. Great, fantastic. Some of these, of these uh, prose portraits Oh my, <laughs> oh my, this is coming out in mid-May, but some of these prose portraits are made to be read on the back porch of your beach cottage. If you've got a beach cottage with the waves rolling in, or with just a calm ocean sitting there glittering like a thousand diamonds under the high summer sun, some of them are meant to be read that way. They are not meant to be read on a very dark and chilly day in early April, so I will wait just a bit in hopes that the weather will perk things up. Uh, and then we have uh, Late Montali, which is, this is exciting. Uh, let's see here. Over the course of a 60-year career, the Nobel Prize winning poet struggled with the weight of centuries-long Italian literary canon. <laughs> okay, he struggled with a whole bunch of other things, too. It was not all his struggles were metaphorical. I thought for a minute when you mentioned weight that you were going to get there, but no. Uh, with his mother tongue, which he considered an intractable medium, and against the Italian literary status quo, which prioritized style above all else. Yes, he would, he would often gripe about the Italian language, which he, he used as no Italian poet had done in, in almost a century. And I, every time you read, every time I've read a crack like that of his, I'm always reminded that it's almost a signpost of Italian literature that all great Italian writers gripe about the Italian language. I think almost that they need to be wrestling with it in that way to produce their greatness. Uh, in his quest to come closer to real experience in his poetry, he cast off unnecessary ornamentation for a new, more direct style. Describing the distinction between the two phases of his work, Montale once said that the first three books were written in a tailcoat, the others in pajamas. <laughs> this later work, though arguably his finest, has long been neglected, especially among English-speaking readers. Now, I hope, translated from the Italian by George Bradley, I hope you don't stress that, though arguably his finest. I hope you don't do that. Uh, uh, you are right. It has been later. The later Montale has been neglected. Uh, Scarcely translated into English until now, the latter half of his poetic oeuvre is brought back to life in this book. The translator here assembles and meticulously translates over 150 poems from six volumes, including the first complete English translation of House in Ogliate and other poems, illuminating for English-speaking readers the first half of Montale's corpus, which most nearly achieves the closeness and immediacy he strove for. Bradley's truly groundbreaking work of translation was constructed in direct consultation with the author's personal notes, only recently discovered, and presents more than 50 poems in English for the first time. Amazing. Just amazing. How wonderful that we live in these adventurous publishing times. Good Lord. Uh, okay, so these both have a date of mid-May. So from New York Review of Books, I don't know, maybe, maybe some of you subscribe to them? Uh, they have a subscription plan. I think they do. And I'm pretty sure that uh, their that their line of NYRB poets, I'm pretty sure that that is included in the subscription line 
I don't know any details. I didn't know I was going to get this, so I had no way to research it. But I think it's something like you sign up for their latest works, and because you're subscribing, you get them at a discount. Is it, is it something like that? Do any of you do that? I don't do that. Uh, I've often considered it, and I'm always, I always held myself back by thinking, well, I love the work they're doing, but I don't love the books. <laughs> So, so I, you know, it wouldn't be worth my while. And if I'm on their mailing list, I'm definitely not going to sign up for it. But I'm wondering if any of you do. But, oh, my. Oh, my. Now, I wish I could say again with these, as I said with the first book, that what I really need to do is find a big, wonderful biography of this person before mid-May. But I don't know of any in English. Maybe a gigantic volume, an earlier volume of poetry. That, that I might have a chance at that. That would be good. Uh, and then this, this last one, which is the box, and then we'll be done. Boy, though, these first two are a tough act to follow. Uh, let's cut this thing open and see what's in here. Um, let's see here. Remember, always put the scissors back where you got them. Don't leave them around, or you're going to roll over right onto them. Uh, What's the matter, baby? Aren't you eager? What? I know, this box just... Do you want to come down here? This box just will not come quietly. We're, I'm still fighting for it. Huh, baby? What are you doing? This is the baby girl. Who's the baby? Come on down here, baby. There you go. <laughs> right to the tips of her toes. Oh, my goodness gracious. All right, let's continue wrestling with this box uh, until we find out what it is. We get what's in here, out of here. It's just one book, but it's big. Oh, oh my. All right. All right. Uh, this officially counts as a really good mail haul. <laughs> Definitely. It's small, but it's really, really good. Uh, okay. Uh, this comes out in late August, so this comes out a week after the Montale, or the, uh, the, uh, Simone Vey, I think, was it, was it, was mid-August? This is, this comes out in late August, about the same time. Uh, and it is big. It is, uh, do you, do you want to tell me here? Almost a thousand pages? 800 pages. This is a stereotypical 800 page biography, the kind of thing that Steve is always asking for. This is a new biography by Catherine Bucknell of Christopher Isherwood, Inside Out. Huge new biography of Christopher Isherwood coming out in late August. Uh, oh, it's going to be published on August 26th, Isherwood's 120th birthday. <laughs> uh, he was, in his account, a cameraman. Uh, with those four words, I am a camera, uh, at the beginning of the novel Goodbye to Berlin, Gore Vidal wrote, Christopher Isherwood became famous. Whether, transporting, whether transposing those he knew into fiction, fictionalizing first or third person versions of himself, or writing memoir, Isherwood made the attributes of that technology the virtues of his prose. Quiet, passive recording, not thinking. Okay, all right. Uh, we're going to try to get through the end of this here. It has blurbs by David Hockney and Edmund White. And the only reason that's not a trifecta is because Gore Vidal is dead. <laughs> uh, in the account of Catherine Bucknell, in her new definitive biography of Isherwood, the aperture is widened. You're not going to stick with the camera, are you? Uh, alongside this famous self-identification are all the other roles Isherwood, consciously or not, played in his life. Neurasthenic child, that's hypochondriac to you and me, uh, Cambridge expulsé, <laughs> okay, dropout to you and me, uh, advocate for gay liberation. Oh, come on. When it pleased him. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, let, let's just let, let you have your way. Celibate monk. <laughs> At least one name that I have spoken in this video can attest otherwise. <laughs> Naturalized American, artistic collaborator, vendata proselytizer, screenwriter, mentor to Auden, Tennessee Williams, Gore Vidal, Tom Gunn, many others. <laughs> Boy, that, that celibate monk listing is taking a beating here. <laughs> and maybe it's into the beating. <laughs> uh, to name a few. Thank you. His patrimony was old England enough that he could claim the man who signed King Charles I's death warrant as an ancestor. 
Yet there is a plaque where he lived in Berlin and a prize named after him in Los Angeles, his final home. What is it, baby? What's the matter? What's the matter with the baby? Huh? <laughs> Frida is assuring me that she never slept with Christopher Ishwood. <laughs> this mostly peripatetic and sometimes volatile life by no means hindered Isherwood's vocation, that of a writer. In a career resulting in over 30 published works, <laughs> his career resulted in that, like a car crash. <laughs> uh, oh, you got novels everywhere. I don't know how we're going to figure this one out. <laughs> uh, novels, film scripts, and plays, letters, spiritual texts, and diaries, Isherwood undertook what might be the most thorough exploration of the self in 20th century literature. Settle down there, Seymour. Uh, through so doing, he helped pioneer literary techniques that would allow for the integration of his own religious and philosophical beliefs and would prefigure the recently popular mode often called autofiction. The, the biographer, Catherine Bucknell here, expertly captures the variousness of Isherwood and his world. This book is, an attentive, is attentive to the work, the man, his friends, their world. It seamlessly combines textual critique with personal history, so that Isherwood's life and work are able to play equally important co-determining roles. It is at once a critical biography of his work and a comprehensive biography of his life. Well, that would be great. That is the goal when you're writing about an author. Uh, and Isherwood, as involved as he was with the writers and events of his times, also serves as a means of entry into the cultural history of the 20th century, one that stretches from the First World War through the West Coast gay liberation movement. It is a biography as capacious as was Isherwood's own writing. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, fantastic. Uh, I feel certain that I know Catherine Bucknell's name, but I, I'm, it's, I'm not, it's, it's not common to me. Uh, but that's all right. Uh, okay, so a big fat biography. I'm always belly aching for him. Now I'm getting one. And this is not the only one. This is, these are coming out in 2023, 2024. It's going to have its crop of these. So this comes out on Isherwood's birthday, <laughs> on August 26th. All right. Uh, so that's a long way off. A couple of these things, the ones that I most want to read are a long way off. But this was a pretty good mail haul. <laughs> I got an 800-page biography, this time Christopher Ishwood. I can certainly find all that I want to find about him between now and his birthday in August. Uh, certainly I can. Uh, two new editions, new translations of Virginia Montale. Two, that's fantastic. And A Life in Letters of the Young, Simone Weil. And, uh, the young pre- pose person, the, a, an actual human being with all sorts of conflicting desires who I don't want, I don't want to be invidious here. I don't want to pick on the dead. I don't want to say pre Camus. <laughs> I don't want to say that as if it's, as if it's bad, <laughs> but, yeah, but fantastic. Just fantastic. So quite a bit of material here for people. Unfortunately, it will be all appearing too late for people in April, but still, quite a bit. Uh, Steve is pleased. <laughs> Very much pleased. So I will wrap this up for now. Not a bad mail haul, and I'll be back. <laughs> Thank you, book two.